Thank you, Danny. I turn with me your Bibles this morning to the book of Exodus, chapter 3. I hope that you're uh, driving down fence posts or setting up milestones as you study through the Bible in your life. And I hope that you always know and remember and realize, and if anybody should ask you or if you should have opportunity, on, if you happen to be on Jeopardy, that you know that someone says, uh, what was the burning bush? You can, where, or where is the story of the burning bush? You can, you can ask, say, Alex, uh, what, what is Exodus chapter 3? That you think of Exodus chapter 3 as the place where Moses saw the burning bush. That's actually where God kind of gets into the Moses story. And that's very important. We've been talking about Moses. We've been talking about Exodus, the way out. This is part 7 because the, the word Exodus is like the word exit. It, and hadas is the Greek word for way or road. It's the road out. It's, it's the way out. And I believe as human beings that we're always, we're in things that we need to get out of. That's what salvation is about. We're, we're in a place or in a spot or we're in a kind of life that we need to get out of. And Jesus said, I came that they might have life. Get out of the death business. And so uh, the book of Exodus, though it is an Old Testament book, I believe has uh, still, we see the heart and mind of God. God says, I want to lead you from where you are to where you need to be, where I want you to be, where God wants you to be. Now, we did. We started with uh, Exodus and we start, looked at Moses. Now, everybody needs a Moses. I, when I tell my life story, when I'm sharing my testimony, and I don't tell my life story so that people will know about me, uh, I say, well, I was born in 1956, and then I jump almost immediately to, in 1970, I gave my life to Christ. And that's where, to me, the most important thing that ever happened in my life began. So people are not, not, not a lot of people may be interested in you or me as to who we are, where we came from, our biography, our life story. But they need to know how you met Jesus, how you became a Christian. You know, in the book of Acts, Paul's testimony of his road uh, to Damascus story is told three different times. Three different times in the book of Acts we see the story of Paul about how he met Jesus on that road, how Jesus came to get it. And he was going to go uh, speak before, he was a prisoner, and he was going to speak before King Agrippa. He was going to talk to a king. And someone said, Paul, you're going to talk to the king. What are you going to talk to him about? You're going to plead for mercy? He says, no, I'm going to tell the king about Jesus. Well, you're going to tell him about Jesus. I'm going to tell him how I, you know, you think, well, I've got to have me a real good sermon. I've got to have a, a really good outline. I've got, to, I've got to make my point. I've got to have a good introduction and a delivery and a good invitation. Paul didn't have to think about all that. He says, I'm going to stand in front of King Agrippa and I'm going to say, King Agrippa, let me tell you how I met Jesus. In the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 11, it says, They overcame the dragon. How did they overcome him? How did they overcome the dragon? He said, You know, he's talking about something that's happening even now as if it's already finished. It is finished. He said they overcame the dragon because they had the blood of the Lamb in one hand and the word of their testimony in the other. Your testimony, your Jesus story. So we all need a, a, a Moses because I can tell you as I tell my life story, I can tell you who led me to Jesus. Who told me about Jesus? Who took me to church? and Who taught me the Bible? I had the opportunity and the honor to speak at the Morgan Baptist Association Pastors Conference Mondays uh, two weeks ago. And uh, it, was, it was a tremendous honor. And uh, I, I've been able, since I've been unemployed, I've been able to go, I think, about every Monday. I've enjoyed that. I haven't been able to go in, in years. So I'm getting a fellowship with the pastors and see them. And it's, it's kind of like church there because sometimes there's a few of us like it was Monday, but on the day that I had a chance to speak, it was a, it was a room full of people. And uh, I guess I was really focused because I didn't really realize after 
I, I knew one person there. There was a uh, Earl Haygood was there. He's a member of the Flint Baptist Church. Now, Earl and his wife May didn't attend church there when I was a little boy. But I met Earl and his wife when we were in the Holy Land together. We, we, walked, we walked where Jesus walked. You know what? Jesus walked a lot. Whew. So we're going to walk where Jesus walked again today? Said, yeah. Let's, let's, uh, let's start in the middle of where he walked. Let's take a bus to that point. I said, no, let's, let's walk every step. He and his wife, precious people, and so he came to the pastor's conference because he heard that I was going to be speaking. And that's, you know, I, I'm not anybody to come see, but uh, it, it speaks of our friendship, not of my ability to speak and preach, or my uh, ability to talk. And uh, like I said, there was a lot of people there, and I got up, I was really zoomed in. I didn't see Earl before we started. He sat down beside me back there. Uh, I... Ned, I pick at you for sitting on the back row, but when I go to pastor's conference, I sit on the back row. So that's the best seat in the house. Best seat in the house. So I went and sat down after I finished. You'd be proud of me. I finished with one minute to spare. And I sitting down, and I could see an older gentleman kind of walking his way toward me. And he came and stood looking down at me, and I looked up in his face. And all of a sudden, I realized it's James Law. James led us and led me and my brother in vacation Bible school before we were even saved, and taught us how to make things. He was a tremendous carpenter. Probably some of the things that Danny does today, if he's going to make a bookshelf, probably or a, or a shoe shine kit, James Law probably taught him how to do that. James and Betty Law, and they've been members. They're still members of the Flint Baptist Church, and he came there because he heard I was speaking. It's people like that that are in my life that have always been. There have always been people who have walked with the Lord longer than I have. They know more about the Lord than I do. My grandmother was, she always, always thought that she was on a first name basis with Jesus. So just her and Jesus is just like they were best friends. It kind of, she came to live with us for a while and it kind of disrupted our life because little mama, what did she do? She went to church, buddy, and she left our behind behind. She said, I don't care if y'all going to lay around in bed. You're going to get up at least and drive, and she didn't drive. She's going to drive me to church, and you're going to come pick me up after preaching. She didn't just go to Sunday school. She'd go to preaching. It's always, I've always thought that's funny. You know, this is a worship service, and we sing, and we pray, and we testify. But what is, I, for all my Christian life, everybody's just called it preaching. Preaching. That's all right. It is preaching. The preaching service. I've had teachers, Sunday school teachers. I remember that when I started attending Sunday school as a new Christian, that Bobby Berry was my Sunday school teacher. And I still remember at the end of every Sunday school class, he would lead us in a quotation of Scripture that was a prayer. He says, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. About every time I see Bobby, and I still he see him bond seal every once in a while, I, I say, I'm going to tell you that I still know that verse of Scripture. I can still recite it from my heart. If you don't have a Moses, you're missing something. If your life has not been just lined with people who have shown you the way and you've been able to follow their footsteps, someone you admire, someone you respect, and someone who just has touched you, you never have to go hungry spiritually. You never have to be completely dependent upon the sermon or the preaching or upon the teaching in Sunday school because there are people in every step of my life who were my Moses. And they taught me about the Bible and they taught me about how to live and how to talk and how to walk and how to relate, how to be a husband, how to be a good son, how to be a father. And they've not all just been people older than me. Some have been younger than me. Some have known things that I, so many of them, all of them knew things that I didn't know, that I knew that every person in your life, you ought to ask the question, God, why are they in my life? And a lot of times, I never even have to ask that question. 
know why you're in my life. I can see it. It's just plain as day. I like that phrase. It's as plain as the nose on your face. Some of you have a really plain nose. You know that? That, that's, 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 that means that's pretty. I've been doing, if you've, if you've been on Facebook, you know I've, I've been going since last week. We remembered our mother's passing. Our mother has been gone a little over a death. She was the 5th of March last year. 5th of March. So I've been, I've been looking at all the brownings and abernathies. I don't know if you, if you go on Facebook, you probably got tired of it. I don't think, I think you... You, uh, you have vain ears, but I, I look through there and I say, oh, God, look, I've got Abernathy ears. And just, we just, they drip down here and they get, and then the older I get, the farther they go out like that. You ever looked at your kin folks and said, well, yeah, yeah we're, we're related. <laughs> got big ears. Plain as the nose on your face and just looking at people. So I know why you're in my life. I know what God is doing. If you don't see the people around you like that, let me encourage you to wake up. Come here, slap me, slap you around a little bit. They're Moses in your life. They're invaluable. And you need more of them. There's nobody in your life that's insignificant or unimportant. There's nobody worthless or without value in your life. They're in your life because God put them there. You say, God, teach me to love people. You know what God will do? He'll send you a mean person. Mean. And you, God says, okay, practice on him. Practice on her. You know what he'll do? He'll, he'll let you get mad. Teach you how to love people. You say, I do love her. Yeah, let's see how, how that goes. I was listening to a comic on line the other night she was saying that she's married and then she divorced and then she talked to one of the young couples that was sitting at her comedy show she said how long have you been married honey and she said uh, three and a half years she says well good you're almost done <laughs> you're almost done let's go on let's, let's, let's go to the next everyone needs a moment Moses but everyone needs a burning bush. Do you know what all the Moses is in my life are saying? So here's God. Here's God. There's God. Look here. Let me, let me help you. Let me help you get to God. Let me show you where God's at. Let me show you the way to God. That's what Moses do. Moses does. Anyway. It's two Moses. A Mosai. I don't know. Moses is this, this. That's, what, that's why everybody needs a Moses, but something more important than Moses. Yes, love your pastor and listen to what he's saying, but he ought to be saying, look here, look here, look here, there's God. <laughs> look here, look here, look here, there's God. Let me get you to God. Hello, I'm John. Let me introduce you to Jesus. Hello, you looking at me? Are you seeing what I... Let me, let me look, 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 look. There's Jesus right there. Now, turn your eyes upon Jesus. That's what all good Moses do. Right. Now, let's look at this. Because here, let's go on to the next and get into our scripture. This is where Moses meets God. Exodus 3. One day Moses was pastoring the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro. He's called Ruel. In, uh, in chapter 2, it confuses everybody. I, I have three names myself that are used commonly and some names that are not used in my presence. He was keeping the flock. He was a priest of Midian. He wasn't a, a God priest. He was a pagan priest. They didn't know who God was. This had a suspicion. Out the edge of the desert near Horeb, the Mount of God. This is probably <coughs> Mount Sinai. Moses met God on Mount Sinai. Okay? Make that connection. You find in the Bible that places and people have lots of different names. And they go through all different kinds of renaming according to who happens to be writing the story. But this is where he's going to receive the Ten Commandments. This is where he met God. Now, he says, The angel of the Lord appeared to him 
as a flame of fire in a bush. Now look at a number, I always look at, I do some translating myself, and I look at other modern translations, and it says, the angel of God appeared unto him. Now that, that's completely, that's completely wrong. It's not one of God's angels. When you see this construction, it's all through the Bible, Old and New Testament. It's not saying that here was one of, here's an angel, and he belonged to God. He's one of God's. The angel of the Lord is a completely different animal altogether. The angel of the Lord is going to talk here in just a minute, and when he talks, the Bible says, and God said. The angel of the Lord is always the Lord. Yeah. It is a it's a presentation of God in angelic form. He's given a special name. He's called the angel of the Lord. So he's not one of God, just one of God's angels. The angel of the Lord, you'll see, you'll know this is the fact, is that it's written probably in your Bible just like this. It's not capital L and then O-R-D. It's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And the O, the R, and the D are smaller. But they're all, it's all capital letters. But the L is B and the O-R-D. But that's the angel of the Lord. And that means, we translate it sometimes Jehovah. It's his sacred name. It is a name that Hebrew people will not say. It's the name Yahweh. Yahweh. And when they come to this place in their Bible, the Hebrew Bible, they say Hashem, which means the name. Or they say Adonai. What does Adonai mean? It means the Lord. Lord. No Amy Grant fans here this morning? Yes. <laughs> so it's a, appeared to him as a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw that the bush was on fire but it didn't burn up, he went over to investigate, and God, since the angel of the Lord, and then God said to him, Moses, Moses. It, it, it's not implying the angel of the Lord says, okay, Lord, I got the fire started, go. And not <laughs> turn it over to God. It's, every, you'll find every time in the Bible it says the angel of the Lord appeared, and God said. They, had, they knew, the Old Testament prophets knew, that when the angel of the Lord was there, they knew they were talking to God. That kind of gets us ready for understanding who Jesus is and who Jesus was. So he sees this flaming bush. Now, let me tell you something. I don't know how jazzy your story about Jesus and how you met Jesus is. You're probably not going to have a burning bush kind of, or a Damascus road. Some of them are very dramatic. But none of them are less important. I found a quotation by Dr. Adrian Rogers this week. It says, where he said, you may find someone who can preach the gospel better than I can. But he says, you will never find a better gospel than the one that I preach. Because there's only one. There are better preachers of the gospel, but there's no better gospel to preach than one. Well, here, God called out to him. And God speaking to him. His story of Jesus, of how he met God, is very, very, very dramatic. Let's go on, Carter, the next slide. Who is it, Moses asked. Don't come any closer, God told him. Take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. If you want to understand what the Bible teaches about being holy, you need to find out how this dirt was holy. It's holy ground. You're not a holy person because you don't chew tobacco. You're not a holy person because you don't cuss. You're not a holy person because you don't go to picture shows and don't go to dances. You're holy because God is in your life. God is holy and wherever He's at is holy. The reason the Bible is called the Holy Bible is not because it's a real good Bible. It's because it is the Word of God. So, you're holy because only God is holy. If He's in your life, then you and I can be holy. I'm the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses covered his face with his hands. He was afraid to look at God. All right, let's go on. 
And the Lord told him, I've seen the deep sorrows of my people in Egypt and heard their pleas for freedom from their harsh taskmasters. I've come to deliver them from the Egyptians and to take them out of Egypt into a good land, a, a large land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites live. Everybody but the Mesquitebites. Now, I, I got a plan. God is never in making it up as you go mode. They've been running the Raiders of the Lost Ark on cable this week. And somebody asked him, the guy, what are you going to do? He said, I don't know. I'm making this up as I go. God never does that. He knows what's coming up next. All right, let's go on. Yes, the will of the people of Israel has risen to me in heaven, and I have seen the heavy task the Egyptians have oppressed them with. Now I'm going to send you to Pharaoh to demand that he let you leave my people out of Egypt. All right, let's go on. God is trying to get your attention. I believe that your life, I know that my life is filled with burning bushes. Now here was obviously a very literal miracle that there was a bush that was on fire and yet it was not being consumed. It was not burning up. But I believe that just like that it says that Moses saw it and got his attention and he went over there just to check it out, it says. God is using a thousand and one things in your life to get your attention and mind. He's, he's, there are thousands of things every day in the life of a lost person where God is speaking to him. Where God is showing him something. Or where God is just trying to get his attention. Something he'll say, oh, let me look into that. I'm finding, though, that more and more people today are so narrow-minded, they're not willing to listen or to look or to talk about something or to think about something different than what they, you know, I've got my opinion, I've got my thoughts, I've got my ideas, I have my convictions, and I'm not going to listen to anything else. Someone like that that runs the risk of being lost for eternity. He wants to connect with you. With the person who is lost, He wants to save them. To me and you, He always wants to, we have to, we have to connect we, he, there is something. We need to stay in touch in a way that He didn't just save us and walk away. He says, God is the kind of God who wants to get your attention and say, here's what we're going to do today. Here's what we're going to do right now. You know the Bible teaches about saying a prayer or having prayer. But then as you get farther and farther on to, into the revelation of God's truth, you find out being in a season in the prayer where Paul starts saying, you need to learn what it means to pray without ceasing. I think we're getting pretty close to a, an understanding in an age. Can you imagine a society that's always on the phone? Can you imagine a society where we walk around and everybody you see is on the phone to somebody? Well, that's God's intention. He never intended for us to bow our heads and cross past our hands and get on our knees or to say, well, we're going we're gonna to have prayer. Well, friends, don't have prayer. Be in prayer. Learn what it means. That is, the Bible teaches that. If you'll find that Jesus started talking to his disciples. He said, I started out calling you servants. But he says, then friends... And when he rose from the grave, he said to Mary, go tell my brothers that I'm alive. So we started out as servants. We, we, we become the Lord's friend. And then we learn what it means to be his brother. The Bible doesn't say, well, here's what this is. And that's what it's always going to be. You've, never, you've not reached the place in your life where God wants you to be in prayer until you understand that you never hang up. You never say goodbye. You never end and say, in Jesus' name, goodbye, I'll talk to you later. But to, to develop a discipline and have a perfect awareness that you're connected. <laughs> Remember when you, did, some of you had computers, when you, did you ever get a modem? When, when you first, Remember when you got your first computer that had a modem where you could connect to the internet? <laughs> And then it would 
connect. Yeah. Holy mackerel. <laughs> Somebody played that in a song the other day. So it sounded like he's trying to connect the AOL. And AOL stands for always lousy. You know when I walk around with my phone? <laughs> Daddy used to do this. Remember, Daddy used to turn his phone off. And when he wanted to use it, he'd turn it on. Yeah. You try to call Daddy when the phone was off. I, why was it off? Well, I didn't need it. <laughs> Daddy. You know, I keep my phone on all the time. I don't turn it off when I lay down and go to sleep. My kids might call the middle of the night. I remember my son called and said, Daddy, I've had a wreck. It's like I was on a metal spring jumping out of bed. You okay? Yeah, my car's all tore up. I don't care about the car. I learned that line from somebody a long time ago. I don't care about the car. The car ain't cool. No matter. You're okay. Connected. I was learning that when people were saying, well, they've taken prayer out of schools. <laughs> I was connected all the time. Nobody ever came to me and said, hey, are you connected? If they'd asked me, I would say, yeah, I'm connected. I'm praying at this very minute while you're looking at me. You need to stop. Uh, well, go ahead, make it. I never stopped praying. They never took prayer out of schools. I carried my Bible in 1972, 73, and 74. They said, well, they've taken Bible reading. And I took my Bible, carried it with my books, to class, to class, to class. And during class, between classes, before the bell rang, I opened up my Bible and my desk, and I read a little bit. So the government can't, can't outlaw prayer. It can't make you stop praying. But I tell you what, people on the internet, they say, I believe we need to put prayer back in school. Do you know that your kid's teacher you know she's a Muslim. Hey, my Monday, I, I, they're going to start doing prayer, and you know why? Don't no, I don't want prayer to be <coughs> like that. Your your kid <coughs> teacher might be an atheist. You say, well, there's really not a God at all. Let's just have a moment of silence. Well, you need to think about that a little bit because evidently you don't spend much time around school, and there's some really really good teachers out there some great teachers in the school system and administrators. But I don't want them teaching my kids about God. Let's go on. Carter. Now look at this. Later on in this story, when they get out of the wilderness, God is going to lead the children of Israel in the daytime by a pillar of smoke and at night by a pillar of fire. The reason I think that when Moses saw the burning bush, I think it was near dusk. And it might have even been dark. Because he saw the fire. And God was making sure that he was being seen. Now let's look at that right there. There is the tabernacle. And the children of Israel camp around about it. And there's the people and they're looking at it. And that's how God was saying, I want to get your attention. Hey, excuse me, everybody. Everybody look this direction. And I, hello, I'm God. Danny pointed me on, on uh, Netflix this week to... Uh, an interview with God. <laughs> there was a reporter. He says he's meeting this guy. Never met him before. He's going to interview him. Three-part series. Article for the paper. He said, do you mind if I take record this? He says, no, go right ahead. He says, all right. I'm going to turn this on. He says, if you would, just speak very clearly. Uh, speak your name and spell it for me just for the record. He said, okay. He went, <clears throat> and he leaned in a little bit. He says, I'm God, G-O-D. It's an interesting movie. Y'all to watch it. An interview with God. God was saying, hello, hello, I'm God. G-O-D. Look here for just a minute. Now here's something very, very important. I think it's very, very, very important. When these people out in the wilderness got hungry, who did they look to? Moses. Moses. Hey, we're thirsty. What's the deal? You bring us out here to die of thirst? When these people, millions of them, when they got hungry, they did, they did, who did they turn to and complain to and, and report to and express their feelings to? Who did they? Moses. It was Moses. 
when they got weary and tired and when they were troubled and when they had pain and hurt, they turned to Moses. You know, something I want you to see in this story that I'm learning too. I don't see any clear, and, and that's why this story is so frustrating. This, is, this story doesn't have a happy ending. The Exodus story, that's why we can look at it and say, don't do it this way. We don't, we're not trying to be like the children of Israel. I don't see any evidence at all that any of those people were trying to connect and have a relationship with God. I don't think they ever did. I don't think they, you know, it's good to have a Moses. But every Moses, Moses was saying, hey, look, <laughs> there's God. Why don't you go and talk to God? How come you're not believing? Why don't you have faith in God? God gave you water when you were thirsty. He fed you bread from heaven when you were hungry. God divided the Red Sea so that we could escape. God led us out. God was the one who did all the plagues of Egypt, the ten plagues. Not me, Moses said. God. The same thing is he said, he said there's no, I don't see any written evidence in the Bible that said that anybody among the children of Israel ever actually learned to get through Moses. And Moses wasn't preventing them. He wasn't an obstacle. Moses wasn't standing in their way. But they never grew to the maturity where it seems that any of them ever had any capacity to look for God, to find God, to have their own relationship with God. Let's go on the card. Do you know the God of the fire? Do you know the God of the fire? That's this story. Whenever you come to me, I don't want to say, let me give you some of my wisdom. Let me give you some of my advice. Let me share some verse of scripture with you. Let me pastor you just a little bit. I say, let's, let's help you get to God. Let's, you can talk to Him. You can pray. He listens. You can walk with Him. You can put your arms around Him. You can be filled with Him. My job is not to be God in your life or to be your mommy. But to be the person who gets you, tells you, and instructs you to get to God. Do you know the God of the fire? Let's go on, Carter. There's a new feature on our website that up at the top tab that just says salvation. And it's got there the, uh, how to become a Christian. If you click on that salvation tab, you go to this first page that says, How can I become a Christian? In other words, you can share this website or share this link on the internet in an email or on your phone or on your computer to your friends and family members. If you're trying to share your faith with them, there's something on your church website that says it's just as easy as ABC. Let's go on, Carter. First of all, we admit. You know, where did we learn this at? Vacation Bible School. A, admit that you need to be saved. Let's go on to the next slide, Carter. And next, there's some verses of scripture there. B, believe that Jesus, you need, for A is admit that you need to be saved. B is believe that Jesus is the Savior. And some verses of scripture there. Let's look at C. Confess Jesus as your Savior and Lord. It's just that easy. Admit, believe, and confess. A, B, C. Admit, believe, confess. In other words, it's not important. Nothing is important except the fact that this can get you to Him. And when you get to Him, you don't need me anymore. Not anymore. Look at the next slide there, Carter. You can become a Christian right now by praying a prayer like this one. And then there's a place on there that says an invitation, and if they receive Christ at the church website, there's a a form there that they can put their name and they can let us know. I found Christ. You were pointing to God and I found Him. Thank you. Just letting us know. 
going cart. We can get hung up with Moses, and some people never make it past Moses. And some people are either elated because they really think Moses is the cat's meow, or they can be dejected because they don't think. A lot of times the children of Israel said, well, let's just stone Moses. <laughs> let's just kill him. Now that's a very popular opinion often of Moses is. Don't get hung up. Become someone who knows the God of the fire. The cleansing fire, the purifying fire, the fire of enthusiasm and zeal. Get to know whatever, yes, have your life. Let, let God fill your life with people who are getting your attention and pointing you to God. Make connection with Him. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, if there's anyone here today who doesn't know you, I pray that they would give their whole life to you. If there's someone here that doesn't have a Moses and they need one, send them one. Help them see that they've already probably got a dozen and just haven't, haven't realized it. Lord, you're trying to get their attention about 101 different things. And they're just ignoring you completely. It's not just that you're everywhere, but you're showing them things and leading them places. God, help us, everyone who's here today, to make such a connection with you that we never have to pray again, but we're always praying. We're praying without ceasing. We're always connected. We're always online. We're always in touch every minute every breathing heartbeat minute we're in touch with you we're in in communication we're connected and you are inside of us you indwell us we don't have to holler to the heavens or reach out or reach up but you're in our heart and you hear every thought that we think lord send send moses to our people today, but also let them see that every one of those Moses is pointing us to you, because knowing you is the most important thing in the world. Your fire, your presence, your holiness is the only thing. <coughs> what you can do in our in our lives, Moses cannot do. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Dan, what's our hymn of invitation today? 187. Number one.